being recorded, but um, your screens won't show up in the recording. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please just put them in the chat and my amazing mother will be here helping organize questions for me to answer at the end. Uh, so my name is Nolan and that's my partner Mia who travels everywhere with me. And if it wasn't for her strong navigational skills, I surely would have gotten lost in the jungle and died by now. But all the photos you see in this presentation are either going to be uh, my photos or her photos. And a little background on both of us. Uh, we're both, uh, we both work as botanists in the United States and we live in Washington state. And all season long, we save up all of our money so that in the off season, we can travel to places that are lacking in botanical research and do floristic surveys. And the way that we do that is just by taking photos of everything we see. And really not just the plants, but we take photos of all the animals, insects, um, and fungi, and everything we see. And then when we come back, it takes us months or sometimes years even to sort through all of our photos and try and identify what we found. And we use all kinds of different resources to do that. Um, one really important resource is iNaturalist. And we put all of our photos on there so that we can share those photos with other scientists who might be interested in our work. Um, so the flora of Ecuador is actually fairly well known compared to a lot of other tropical Andean countries. Um, but there's just so many plants there. The sheer number of species is so high that there's virtually endless botanical work to be done there. There's over 18,000 plant species and new ones are described all the time. Um, approximately 5,400 of those plant species are endemic to Ecuador, meaning that they don't grow anywhere else. And a whopping 4,200 orchid species occur in Ecuador. Um, for comparison, Ecuador is roughly the size of the state of Colorado. Um, but Colorado only has 3,000 plant species. So Ecuador has about six times as many plant species in the same area. So you can see why this might be paradise for a couple of botanists like us. And there's four main geographic regions in Ecuador. There's the uh, Costa or coastal region on the west side, the Sierra region, which encompasses the Andean mountain range in the middle, uh, and the Oriente, which covers um, the east side, everything east of the Andes. And this is part of the larger Amazon basin. Uh, the area of the Amazon covered by Ecuador is actually just about 2% of the total Amazon river basin. And within Ecuador, there are also two biodiversity hotspots. There's the Choco Magdalena Tucumán forests up here on the, on the northwest side of the country, and the tropical Andean hotspot, which runs up through Ecuador on the east side of the Andes. And for something to be considered a biodiversity hotspot, that just means that it must have over 3,000 endemic species um, but also it means that it must have lost 70% of its original forest cover. So when we say something's a biodiversity hotspot, that means that the area is, the biodiversity there is very threatened. Oh, the fourth region that I forgot to mention was the Galapagos uh, Islands, which are not pictured here, but far out into the sea to the west. And the reasons why tropical South America is so biologically diverse are still debated, but certainly a large part of it is due to the formation of the Andes Mountains. And the Andes are one of the youngest mountain ranges on the planet and one of the tallest. And as they formed, they created a tremendous amount of diversity in terms of climate and geology. And so that has driven the evolution of a tremendous amount of species. And here's a screenshot of our iNaturalist observations from our trip, just so you can get a sense of where we went. And 
We obscured a lot of the exact coordinates of our observations to protect against poaching, especially for sensitive species like orchids. Uh, so it actually looks like we went more places than we did. But our trip was about a month long and we spent the entire time just in the Sierra region. We didn't even visit any of the other geographic regions. And each of those geographic regions have a distinctly different flora. Um, but in just one month, I took over 7,000 photos and I don't even know how many Mia took, but just as many probably. We saw over 1,000 plant species and sorry, over 1,000 species total and over 550 different plant species. And so I decided to organize this presentation by elevation zones because within each geographic region, plants um, zone strongly with elevation. So I split it up into three categories, the pre-montane forests, the cloud forests, and the paramo. So let's start with the pre-montane forests. And really there's no clear boundary between these elevation zones. Um, and the elevation where they begin and end can change based on a variety of factors. Different scientists define them differently, but I'm using pre-montane forests to refer to forests between 1,000 and 2,500 meters. And it seems kind of funny to me to refer to areas at, that are at 8,000 feet elevation as pre-montane, but the tallest peak in Ecuador is over 20,000 feet tall. So really we were just in the foothills of the Andes here. And it is just impossible to capture with a picture how rich these forests are. Um, we spent the first couple days of our trip just hiking back and forth along this same little section of trail here um, and I still don't feel like we even came close to photographing all the plants there. Premontane forests are also one of the most threatened habitats in Ecuador because most of the uh, larger national parks are either higher up in the Andes or lower down in the Amazon. And premontane forests have kind of been left out of the general conservation strategy in Ecuador. Also, these areas have a perfect climate for growing crops like chocolate and coffee. So the rates of deforestation in these areas is uh, sadly very, very high. Um, so let's look at some of the places we went on our trip. Uh, this is the shed where we spent the first couple nights sleeping. And at $5 a night, I can say it was an excellent bargain. And the first thing that really, really blew my mind as a botanist coming down here from the temperate parts of the world was just seeing how many aeroids were everywhere. And aeroids are plants in the family Araceae. And for uh, any of you who live outside the tropics, you're probably just used to seeing them as house plants like me. So it was spectacular to see, see them in their natural habitat. And down in the pre-montane forests, a lot of them were blooming too. And I really, really liked the uh, flowers, the inflorescences on these two anthurium species. Uh, anthurium oxybellium is a fairly common species that was easy to figure out with its distinctive pattern on the spathe, which is this leafy back part of the flower. I still haven't figured out this anthurium yet, even though it has such a large distinctive inflorescence. And like I was saying, sometimes it takes us years to, to figure out everything that we saw on these trips and lots of emails with, with specialists who study those species. Something really cool we noticed with a lot of the aeroids here was that they had the symbiotic relationship with um, termites and the termites would use the stems and the roots of the aeroids as structure to build these massive termite colonies. And during the day, these termite colonies were basically deserted. But if you went out there at night, I'm going to show you a little video of what it looks like at night. All the termites are active. Here, our guide, uh, Jose, is just telling us how these termites are able to rebuild their nest, uh, rebuild damage like that in just a few minutes. And I have no idea how many individual termites might be in a colony like this.
So um, speaking of insects, at our second campsite of the trip, we ended up having a nasty encounter with some ants. We set up our tent in what we thought was a perfect place uh, to camp for the night. And we just went for a short little walk. And when we came back, our tent was just crawling with ants, just absolutely covered with hundreds of ants. And they were the angriest, most scary looking ants I've ever seen. Um, this actually is not a picture of the ant from this campsite. I was too busy trying to get the ants off our tent to take any pictures of them. But this is an example of how threatening, how menacing some of the ants can look down in South America. Um, this was an ant species that we saw in Argentina a few years ago. So we were lucky enough not to have any other bad encounters with any uh, snakes or poisonous insects or anything like that, except for one time when a caterpillar got into Mia's boot without her realizing it, and it stung her foot repeatedly. And she ended up having these nasty welts on her foot for like three days. Um, it wasn't either of these caterpillars. Sadly, again, we failed to take a picture of that one because we were too busy dealing with this situation. Um, but some people, I've heard a lot of people say that caterpillars are actually the most dangerous animals in the Amazon rainforest, with some of them having incredibly painful stings that can um, leave your limbs numb for days at a time or potentially even be fatal. And a lot of them have these really incredible warning colors and patterns to show you not to touch them. So bromeliads um, in the family Bromeliaceae were another really common group down in the pre-montane forests. And it was really cool. Actually, they were pretty common at every, every elevation zone that we went to, but um, there was a lot more of them blooming down here in the pre-montane forests where it's warmer. And these are both fairly common widespread species, but I really think that both of these have especially spectacular flowers. Mm, here's another one with a really cool showy inflorescence. Okay, and I think more than any other family, the Jesneriaceae really stole my heart on this trip. And Jesneriaceae, also sometimes called the African violet family, even though they're not related to violets and they occur all over in the tropics um, and outside the tropics, not just in Africa. But I think this was one of the, the most spectacular families that we saw. And it was the second most common family we saw after the Orchidaceae. We ended up uh, all total photographing 36 different Jesneriad species. This one was one of my favorites because it was super common along one of the hikes we did. And it was just lining both sides of the trail, with these spectacular red blooms. Uh, here's some more really neat Jesneriads that we saw down in the pre-montane forests. I really like all the little details of the flowers here, like the textures of the calyx or the sepals and all of the interesting hairs and, and color patterns. Um, some of these I wasn't able to identify. Uh, this one, let's see, Columnia ericae is a pretty widespread common species in South America. Uh, but this variety, variety Archidone, is an endemic variety to the region of Ecuador that we were in on the um, east side of the Andes here. And this variety is pretty easily distinguishable from the more common variety by the extra curvature in the flower. And um, for any species that I was able to confirm that it was an Ecuadorian endemic species, I put an asterisk on it like this one. And like this begonia, which was another um, rare Ecuadorian endemic that we were lucky enough to see blooming. Definitely one of the highlights of the trip. Something I really enjoy when traveling is seeing how evolution has sculpted plant families that I'm familiar with to suit the local conditions. So these um, plants are both in the Ericaceae family, which is the family of blueberries. And you can see, if you're familiar with blueberry flowers, they do bear a little resemblance to blueberry flowers. But the corollas on both these species are really um, elongated. 
And there's a reason for that that I'll get into in just a second. Other families that I'm used to seeing in North America, like the Campanulaceae or the bellflower family, are virtually unrecognizable in the tropics. I never would have guessed what these were without um, looking them up. And so, yeah, if you're wondering why so many of these plants have sort of a similar look, it's because they all um, it's because they all evolved to attract hummingbirds as their primary pollinators. And there's 132 species of hummingbirds in Ecuador. So this is a really good strategy that a lot of unrelated plants have evolved. It's called hummingbird uh, pollination syndrome. And um, flowers typically have elongated corollas. Um, the corolla is the flower petals. That's the term for all the flower petals. So they have elongated corollas and usually bright red or yellow or pinkish colors like all those flowers we just saw. And that's the reason why so many of the South American Ericaceae have those elongated tubular flowers. And here are just three species of hummingbird that Mia was able to photograph in like five minutes sitting outside this, this feeder. Uh, I'm really glad she has the patience for bird photography because I, I do not. There's a reason I like, to, I like to take pictures of plants mostly. But on this trip, I did really enjoy taking pictures of lepidopterans, uh, moths and butterflies. And at this reserve, we got to help build this cool black light mothing setup and visit it um, a couple of times a day for three days. And in that time, I photographed over 150 species of moths, which was just incredible. And it was really cool because every time you'd visit, even like you'd be gone for like an hour and come back and there'd be all different moths there. And here's just a couple of the most colorful ones that we saw, some of my favorites. Here's the biggest one we saw, which was very impressive. A lot of moths use their bright colors to warn predators that they taste bad. But most insects in the jungle prefer to just blend in with the vegetation. And so we saw these two cool species of thorn mimicking um, tree hoppers, which were both on two different species of spiny solanaceae plants or plants in the tomato family. And the stick insects are another group that has mastered hiding in plain sight. And it's true, even though we were out there like carefully inspecting plants all day, every day, we almost never saw stick insects in the daytime. But they're super easy to find at night, like a lot of insects, if you go out with a flashlight, because that's when a lot of insects come out to feed and mate, because they have better odds um, staying hidden from predators in the dark and they have to do these activities at some point. So we saw all kinds of stick bugs that were really cool. Like this one that's um, mimicking a tiny thorny twig. There was some that were mimicking like leaves and dead branches. And um, one of my favorites was this one that was mimicking uh, the moss and lichen species that were common on the trees near here. And uh, speaking of insects, here's a plant that eats insects. This is a Utricularia, uh, also called a bladder wart. Um, and this is a carnivorous plant. And until I went to Ecuador, I thought that Utricularias could only be aquatic species. But this one is an epiphytic species. And unfortunately, I didn't get a very good photo of it in its habitat. Um, but it was really cool to see one of these growing in a completely eco different ecological niche than what I'm used to seeing. And I did look for the characteristic bladder traps that they use to capture insects, but I couldn't find any. And apparently um, they're a lot smaller uh, in, the, in the terrestrial species and they, they're hidden in the soil. And this might not be the most impressive looking flower ever, but this was definitely our most exciting find in the pre-montane forests. After we saw this plant, we just could not stop thinking about it. And we could not figure out what it was. I was completely stumped. 
And I can't take any credit for figuring it out. I had help from someone on iNaturalist, which is one of the reasons why I love that website so much. Um, but once we were able to confirm that this plant was in the genus Neriacanthus in the family Acanthaceae, um, we were able to, we realized that as soon as we figured out the genus that this was an undescribed species. And it was really easy to figure this out because there's only six uh, Neriacanthus species currently described. They range from tropical South America up through Central America and into the Caribbean. And our, this species that we saw here was very distinctive and different from all of the other known species. You see how this one has these long, skinny leaves? Well, all of the other known species have these big, broad, elliptic leaves. So we're super excited on our next visit to Ecuador. We're going to try and collect that plant so that we can get a specimen deposited in the herbarium in Ecuador. And then someone who's an expert on this group of plants can get to work on describing it. Oh, and here's Mia at the spot where we found it, which was such a cool spot. It just honestly looks like somewhere where you might find some undescribed species. It was kind of an unusual spot with this big sandstone cliff. Um, in the jungle, usually rocky outcrops get covered up with vegetation really fast, but there was this big exposed sandstone cliff that we were hiking along with all these little waterfalls trickling down it. And we saw so many cool plants there. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if there was more undescribed species there. Okay, so moving up in elevation. Next, let's explore the high elevation cloud forests. Also sometimes called elfin forests because uh, the trees are so small and twisted up at the top. And you can see that they have a lot fewer um, epiphytic bromeliads and aeroids, and a lot of these have been replaced with uh, mosses and lichens. And these forests actually reminded me a lot of the temperate rainforests uh, in Washington State, where I live. And the so the undeniable stars of the cloud forest are the orchids and. So orchids are the most diverse family in the entire world with over 28,000 described species. In Ecuador alone, there's 4,200 species described. And in just one month on our trip, we photographed 55 different orchid species, which is more than there are in Washington state where I live, more than in the entire state. And to me, the most fascinating of all these orchids that we saw are definitely the Pleurothalids, um, orchids in the subtribe Pleurothalidinae, which is the most specious, specious group of orchids on the planet. And an estimated one fifth of all known orchid species are Pleurothalids. Um, Pleurothalids can only be found growing in North and South America in tropical and subtropical regions. And interestingly, they're also thought to be one of the most recent diversifications within the orchid family. And my personal favorite Pleurothalids are definitely the Lepanthes. These minute orchids, they only bloom on the underside of their leaves, and they're actually really difficult to find. So there was this famous botanist from, um, he collected plants here in this part of Ecuador in the early 19th century. And he, um, even though this region is famous for its Lepanthes diversity, he didn't collect a single Lepanthes the whole time he was here, even though he collected thousands of plant specimens. And so some people think it's possible he might have just never even noticed them. And I'll show you why that is. It's because they have these really tattered leaves or sometimes they're covered in epiphytes and really the only way to reliably find these orchids is to just randomly flip, flip these leaves until you see them. So one reason why Pleurothalids are so diverse is because of their highly specialized relationships with their pollinators, with many species receiving pollination services from just a single species of insect, usually a fly or a gnat. 
And many fluorothalids have evolved this flexible appendage right here called an appendix. And what's so cool about this is that different fluorothalids use this piece for different purposes. So for some fluorothalids, it's just part of the overall floral presentation to attract pollinators. Um, others use it to form a trap door that snaps shut, almost like a Venus flytrap, squeezing insects against the sticky pollen packets to help glue them to the insect for better pollination. Um, and yet others use it for sexual deception, which is a, a fairly common pollinator attraction strategy among orchids, where orchids will um, mimic potential mates of the insect with um, physical structures like this or chemical cues to try to lure them in uh, instead of giving them a reward like pollen or nectar like most flowers do. And so that saves the plant's energy not having to produce, produce those rewards. Lepanthes are really interesting because they're only the second genus of orchids in the world uh, known to use a specific type of sexual deception called pseudocopulatory pollination. And the other group of orchids that does this is an unrelated group of orchids in Australia. And so pseudocopulatory pollination means that the pollinator, in this case a fungus gnat, actually has to connect its genitalia to the flower in order for pollination to occur which is such an incredibly specialized relationship, it's mind boggling to think how this could have evolved. And a lot of times the fly will, will stay on the, on the flower until it completes the entire mating process, sometimes staying there for like 20 minutes. And remarkably, this process has only ever been observed in the wild just a handful of times. Um, but check out these really awesome detailed pictures by Mario Blanco and Gabriel Barbosa at the University of Costa Rica. I would love to see this process. And next time we're down there in Ecuador, I definitely wanna try and sit with the Lepanthes all day and see if I can see any flies coming and going. Um, Masdevalia is another really uh, beautiful genus of Pleurothalids and is super popular in cultivation. And you can see why. And unfortunately, orchids like this one are some of the most threatened orchids um, out there because of the, the high poaching pressures on these orchids. Here's another really spectacular Mastavalia that's a, a endemic species to Ecuador. This one's found on the west side of the mountains. Something else that's kind of fun is that a lot of times I, with these tiny orchids, especially, I won't even realize that they're separate species until I get home and review my photos. But you can see subtle differences in the spotting patterns and um, the textures and hairs on these two orchids. And even though they're closely related, they're um, different species and they probably rely on different insects for pollination. Um, and that's what's driven the diversity of so many of these pleurothalids is these really specialized pollinator relationships. Stellus is one of the least uh, studied groups of pleurothalid orchids. So if there's any of you out there looking to make a career studying in orchids, um, this would be a great genus to work on. Trichosalpinx was another one of my favorite orchids of the trip. Okay, and now um, we're at one of the most interesting pleurothalid genre out there, the tegias. And so up until 2001, tegia was thought to be a small genus with only six different species from Ecuador and Colombia. But then in the last 20, in the, uh, and since then, since 2001, 26 new species have described, been described mostly by just one scientist, Lou Jost and his team. And all these species are known from just one valley in Ecuador. And all 26 share features that make them distinctly different from the previously known species, indicating that this probably represents one of the largest and uh, most rapid explosive radiations of plant evolution that's ever been recorded. 
And many of these species are really narrow endemics occurring on just one ridge. And different species can be found on both sides of the valley, even though um, the mountains on both sides might just be a few miles apart in some places. The ridgeline we climbed is known to have 16 different species, although we saw six in flower. And hiking up into the Tigia zone is truly just a magical experience. So you're climbing this ridge for like two days. It's super steep, super muddy. There's not a trace of these orchids. And then at the end of the second day, you um, turn a corner and all of a sudden you're in the Tigia zone and they are just everywhere. Like on every mossy surface they're growing. And they just cover the ground. Um, multiple species grow like tangled together with their long, weird, gangly flower stalks, um, all different shades of purple and red and yellow, all growing together. Most of them grow low to the ground. A few uh, climb a little ways up into the trees. Um, and they've got these really spectacular leaves, even when they're not blooming, these vibrant pink and purple leaves that look like little gems and the green moss. It was such a cool experience. It was one of the most amazing places I've ever been in my entire life. And we got to go up here with um, our friend Tito, who's one of the park rangers there. And we had so much fun hanging out with Tito. He loves climbing trees. He climbed every single tree he could get up looking for new orchid species. And he's so good at finding orchids there. It was a blast to be out there with him. And I don't think we would have seen half the orchids on this hike without him. So I really hope that we get to hang out with him when we go back. And here are a few more orchids, non pleurothalid orchids that we saw. Uh, this Oncidium is pretty rare and this one smelled really nice. Uh, a lot of these maxillarias were really aromatic too. And they have very big, spectacular flowers. Um, this was one of the strangest orchids we saw, this epidendrum with this really long column. And then it like kind of curved around. It's hard to see it curved around and back up. Um, and then it had these really intricate patterns and like ciliate margin petals. It was super cool to see this one. Uh, I'm not even gonna try and pronounce the name of this one. Uh, here's another great photo Mia got of me and Tito orchid hunting. And it's probably hard to find anything that can top the cloud forest orchids, but if there's anything that might do it, maybe it's the Bomarias, which are in the family Alstromeriaceae or the Peruvian lily family, although they're not super closely related to lilies. But these were definitely some of my favorite cloud forest plants with their massive floral displays. It was really cool to see Bomaria uncifolia, which is a rare uh, species that's endemic to Ecuador. Of course, the Jesneriads just never fail to impress. I love all the tiny little details on these flowers. Like again, the, the calyx and the hairs, all the little spots, the fused um, anthers on this species were really cool. This Piercia is an Ecuadorian endemic. Um, this species is currently in the process of being described um, by my friend John Clark. So I didn't get a name on that one yet, but I think it's about to be published soon. Uh, Drymonia ignea was definitely my favorite Jesneri out of the trip. I mean, just look at those calyxes. They're so bright and cool. And this is another rare Ecuadorian endemic species, also described recently by John Clark. Um, Quatresia harlingiana is a really cool shrubby solanaceae that we saw. And I really, really appreciated the color of the flowers on this one. I thought it was just so cool. Um, let's see, this is where we camp for a few nights. And it was a little bit of a step down from our, our nice shed earlier in the trip, uh, mainly because it was so smoky in here. But 
it did keep us dry and protected us when there was a really crazy windstorm one night and there was tons of falling branches on the sheet metal roof. It was kind of scary actually. Um, we didn't see as many insects up at the higher elevations because it's a lot colder up there, but we did see this really funny little weevil who looks like they've been hitting the gym every day. And I really like this picture because it looks like the weevil is trying to push this giant block. And we also saw the most ridiculous birds. Um, this is the very famous, infamous Andean cock of the rock. And let me just show you this little video. Uh, we got to see a cock of the rock lek. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure why the video is. Oh, there we go. There's the video. But listen to their funny, funny calls. Yeah, so these were the gooviest birds, and um, we got to go see a, a cock of the rock lek, which is one tree where a bunch of them come and gather in one place and hang out. So I think at one point there was like like 14 of them in this one tree. It was awesome. All right, so now on to the last habitat that I want to talk about today, which is the Paramo. And... Um, so the exact elevation where the Prama begins is pretty variable, but it's usually somewhere around 3,000 meters. And I really like this picture because you can see exactly where the cloud forest ends and the Prama begins. Um, above tree line, it's mostly just bunch grasses and hardy shrubs and uh, very small growing plants. And so this is one of three very different Paramo areas that we went to. This is the summit of Volcan Sumaco, which was a really cool spot for us to visit um, because this volcano is set really far off from the main Andean arc, volcanic arc. This red dot is where Sumaco is. And then you can see the main Andean, Andean mountain range is over here. You can see these big white spots are uh, the bigger volcanoes. And because it's so far away, it acts like a little sky island, an isolated area um, where all kinds of different endemic species have evolved. So including plants and animals, I think there's something like over a hundred endemic species found at Volcan Samaco. And it was really kind of spooky climbing up to the top with all the fog. We were pretty much socked in the whole way. And yeah, it's very strange being on some of these narrow ridges when you just can't see anything around you. Uh, there's Mia. And this was our guide, Ilario, who told us that this was his 99th time climbing the volcano. And he was not quite as enthusiastic about our many plant stops as Tito was, but we still had a great time with Hilario. Uh, we got lucky and it cleared up a little bit at the top. And um, you can see also how rocky the soil up, he up here is, which was really cool and different from a lot of the other Pramo areas where we were. Uh, this is still a very active volcano, and there's this big caldera at the top because this volcano has erupted like six times in the last uh, 400 years. Uh, all those, those were all pretty small eruptions, but it has had some much larger eruptions uh, further back in the past. And something that I really didn't expect to see on the summit of this volcano was a tall shrubby orchid as the dominant species, Elianthus orontiacus. This was so cool to see. I've never seen one orchid dominate a landscape so thoroughly. It was really spectacular. Other families that were super dominant up there were like Asteraceae and um, Lycopodiaceae and um, a lot of Ericaceae too. 
Uh, this was my favorite find at the summit of Sumaco. I just think this is the most adorable little gentian that you could ever see. I love this plant. This was also the first place where I was introduced to the fern genus Jamesonia, which is definitely my new favorite fern genus. I just love how weird and awkward these ferns are with their long, like look how long some of these fronds are. It's very bizarre. And then there's also Jamesonias like this, these multi-branching, multi-pinnate Jamesonias. And it's very interesting because until recently, um, these were thought to be in a totally different genus, Ariosaurus, and understandably so, because they look nothing like these Jamesonias. But then in 2004, a molecular study comparing the genomes showed that these actually belong in the genus Jamesonia, and that species like this, Ariosaurus, they actually correspond to uh, different habitat types. So um, the tall, skinny Jamesonias occur only up in the Paramo, and then these branching Jamesonias occur a little lower down in like the sheltered cloud forests. Um, this is one of the endemic species at Sumaco, an endemic subspecies of Calciolaria that was really, really neat to see. These are called slipper flowers because they have this inflated uh, corolla, like a, I guess like a slipper. Here are some of the orchids we saw at the summit. There's a lot of different epidendrum species up there. And I think some of these have really neat color palettes. I love all the greens and burgundies and oranges, kind of different colors than you would see on a lot of orchids. Okay, so this is the next uh, Paramo that we went to. And this one was very, very different from Smako. Um, this one was really, wet and boggy and there was hardly any exposed rock and also this was part of the the main Andean arc so the flora here was like almost completely different from at Sumaco uh, there were these really cool uh, giant um, ferns everywhere uh, I can't see the name it's covered up but um, they're in the Blechnesi family they're if you happen to be in North America or Europe, you might be familiar with deer ferns. And these are like a crazy overgrown version of that. And yeah, here's just another view of what it looked like in this Pramo. Here's me and Tito again, looking at orchids. And yeah, you can see really the, the only thing this spot did have in common with Sumaco was just that it was constantly socked in with these with thick clouds. And here's what we were looking at in that last picture. This is Dracrinanthes aberrans, which is the um, pleurothallid species known to occur at the highest elevations. And so this species, this delicate little orchid experiences freezing temperatures almost every single night up here, which is kind of unbelievable. Uh, and the orchids might be tiny and delicate up here, but some plants like these lycophytes were just growing like crazy. And just being up here in the thick fog, like soaked to your bone from the cold fog, seeing these weird uh, lycophyte species, it almost felt more like I was looking at exotic corals than plants. Uh, felt like you could be underwater. Um, here's another really neat Phlegmarius, Phlegmarius species that we saw. And what was kind of interesting about this one is that we only saw one single individual of this species. And that was something that kind of struck me about being in the tropics that was a little unusual is that a lot of times we would just see single individuals of a species. And that's kind of different from my experiences in temperate botany, where even with super rare species, usually you'll see a decent amount of them growing together as long as you're in suitable habitat. But we quickly learned in Ecuador never to walk by a species because there was no guarantee that you were going to see it ever again. Um, oh my God, this one just blows my mind. This is the craziest lycophyte I have ever seen. Everything about this plant is just ridiculous. It's got such a long stem, um, such a such bizarre colors. 
And I am just dying to know what this species is. I have tried to figure it out and you'd think it would be easy because it's so unusual, but I haven't been able to figure this one out yet. So if there's any lycophyte enthusiasts in the audience, please, I beg you to help me figure this out. Uh, let's see, as, so yeah, as you might expect from an alpine habitat, there was a lot of cushion plants up there, um, which is a really common adaptation shared by all kinds of different unrelated plants all around the world to deal with harsh alpine environments. Uh, so this was a really neat cushion plant species, Xenophyllum humile in the Asteraceae or the sunflower family. Uh, here's some gentians because everybody loves gentians. Gentianella splendens is an Ecuadorian endemic. Uh, I was really excited to see the Hellenias are super common, but they're so cool. I think with their reflexed spurs on the corolla, I, I think they're super neat. This one, I give this one the award for cutest um, plant of the entire trip, but you'll have to let me know what you think. I just love everything about this species. It's in the Orobon Casey family. Um, and so something about being up in these colder paramos was that because the climate, even though it's still within the tropics, it's a colder climate. So it's more similar to a temperate climate. And there was a lot more floral affinities between these habitats and the areas that I'm used to botanizing in. So I was able to recognize a lot more um, plants, at least to the family level up there. Um, here's Gyodendron punctatum putting on a really awesome floral display in a brief moment without fog. This plant is in the Lauranthaceae family, which is a, the biggest family of plant-on-plant -plant parasites in the world uh, and is most diverse in South America. Okay, and here's the final Paramo stop that we went to. This one was very different from from the first two, excuse me. Um, this area is right on the border with Colombia. And this is one of the only places in Ecuador where you can find espaletias, which are these tall, funny plants that you see here. And that's those are all espaletias down there. All these little shrubby looking things in the distance are all espaletias. And so um, Espaletias are also called frailejones, which means tall monks. And I just absolutely love that name for them. Um, and the weather up here fluctuates like crazy between intense equatorial sun and freezing cold fog and wind and rain. And so a lot of plants just stay low to the ground or have really hardy shrubby growth forms to deal with this. But the Espaletias have a really cool strategy. They're covered in just the finest, softest, silkiest hairs you can possibly imagine. Um, and these hairs act like a blanket from the cold and they also protect them against the harsh UV radiation. Uh, and they also have marcescent stems, which means they take old dead leaves as they grow just for extra insulation. And the leaves are so like soft that they soak up water like a sponge. And if you squeeze them, they actually just like, drip like a sponge. And so some people say that Espaletias, after they colonize an area, they actually will form their own lakes and rivers because they suck so much moisture out of the fog and then it all drips down. And I don't think this has ever been like studied scientifically, but I, I could, I could believe it. I think there's some potential for this phenomenon to, to be real after what we saw. Um, and yeah, so Espaletias are remarkably, they're in the Asteraceae family and they look like little sunflowers. The flowers smell amazing. They smell just like chocolate chip cookies, I think, freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. And so this was such a nice way to end our trip up here in the Espaletia Paramo. Um, this was our last campsite of the trip and definitely the most beautiful campsite of the entire trip. And so that's all I have today, folks. Um, I really hope that everyone enjoyed this. I know I had a lot of fun presenting all this stuff. I could 
keep talking about this all day. And um, if you enjoyed this and you want to donate, I uh, would greatly appreciate that. You could donate to me on Venmo or on PayPal. Um, all donations will go towards supporting our next botanical expedition to South America, which I am thrilled to announce is at the end of the month, um, we're headed back down there for our longest botanical adventure yet. So I will have tons of new photos to share with you in just a month. Okay, so now I'm going to take a look at some of the questions in the chat. I'll go ahead and read the questions. So someone says, earlier you mentioned deforestation in the pre-montane areas due to chocolate and coffee. As U.S. consumers of chocolate and coffee, is there anything we can do to minimize our impact on those ecosystems? That is an excellent question. And I don't really know the answer. I don't know how, how legitimate like a lot of the brands that advertise themselves as being environmentally ethical and fair trade are. Um, I would say it's probably better to buy brands that advertise as being um, ethical, but I don't know how well you can trust those brands. So unfortunately, I really don't have a good answer for that. I wish I did. Um, next question. How did you pick the areas to visit? It seems like it would be so hard to narrow down your choices. Yes, it is impossible to pick places to visit. Um, we thought going down there that being such a small country, we would be all over the country. Um, Ecuador has a great bus system. It's easy to get around. We thought we'd see the whole country and be done, but we ended up never going more than a few hours away from Quito, the capital, because we just kept, I don't know, we just kind of talked to people and we looked at iNaturalist a lot to see where other people had gone. Um, we were lucky enough to make some connections with people that were down there who uh, were happy to um, you know, let us visit some special areas that they were in charge of protecting. And there's, I have an endless list of more places that I wanna go in Ecuador. So that's why we're going back at the end of the month. We'll see how far away from Quito we make it this time. Next question. For those undescribed species, how do you determine that they're undescribed in that particular group? No di dichotomous key if they're undescribed, I guess. Yeah, so for, at least for Neriacanthus, um, that one was actually, once we had the genus, it was actually really easy to determine that it was undescribed because it's so distinctive from other members of its genus. Um, but that's not usually the case. Um, usually, you got to kind of piece together different disparate information from different papers and just do a lot of sorting through scientific publications to try and be as sure as you possibly can be that no one has described that species before you. Um, and that's a process that we're working on on some of the other species that we saw for some groups that where it's not quite as straightforward as the Naria campus. Okay, next question. I wanted to ask what made you get into this career and your advice to someone who is really passionate about plants and conserving them to get into a career like I did. I'm currently a final year master's student from India. Well, first off, congratulations on being in your final year of your master's degree. Um, I found my way into botany just because I really enjoyed it, I guess. Um, I never really planned on doing this. And um, I just kind of fell into it through some people I met and some classes that I took. And then I, I really love some of the habitats in, in North America. And that's where I do a lot of like work botany and is in the Pacific Northwest around like Washington and Idaho State. And I really enjoy that. Um, but I've always just been more excited by places like Ecuador 
um, where just so little is known about the flora. And it's really important to me to go do what I can to try and um, try and document what's growing in these places because a lot of it really is being lost at an alarming rate that I, I try not to think about, but um, I want to do my best to document what's, what's in places where we're still just beginning to understand what's there uh, before it's lost. And so, okay, I'm kind of rambling here, but anyways, so this kind of thing is not my career. I, this is totally self-supported. I just do this because I'm passionate about it. But I do work in botany. I did go to school for that. I just have a bachelor's of biology. And um, I, I work doing much less exciting stuff than this, but then I use that to be able to do things like this that I think are really important. Um, as for advice for getting into botany as a career, I say just go out there and start looking at plants, all the plants you can find, try to figure out what they're called. Once you have their name, you'll be able to learn more about them. Try to figure out what's going on with them, how and why they're thriving in that environment and how they're interacting with each other and with animals. And I think that if you just, if you just go out there and start learning about plants, you'll, um, you'll figure out a way to, to turn your interest into more than just a hobby. So, Next question. Um, how did you organize getting guides for these trips? Also, apologies if you mentioned this, but what time of year were you there? Uh, so we were there in the month of January. Ecuador is right on the equator, of course. It technically has a dry season and a wet season, but I think they're pretty much indistinguishable. And in the tropics like that, um, it's interesting because a lot of plants rely on things other than seasonal cues to bloom. And, um, and you don't get like the big like wildflower meadows and big like springtime blooms like you do in, in temperate areas. Um, and because the resources are so available all year round in the tropics, you actually just get kind of random plants blooming at random times throughout the year. Or some plants like orchids tend to just bloom throughout the entire year. Uh, I think that's see, that's half your question. Um, as far as organizing guides, uh, we just sent a lot of emails before we went, and anyone that we could, and that also to answer your question earlier, Julia, that um, that really just helped us determine where we were going. Was just people who emailed us back and wanted to hang out with us. Uh, next question is related. Did you use any porters? No, we never use porters, um, have not used porters. Um, a lot of places we went, it's required that you have guides to go there because it's such a sensitive area. Um, but also it's just fantastic to be with those people who know the area so much better than, than I ever will. Like I was serious when I said that I don't think we would have found half the orchids on that hike without Tito. He was incredible. Um, we never used porters. We did um, pack in our stuff uh, via mule on one hike, and that was exciting. I was kind of reluctant to do that. I was thinking like, why do we need to do this? But I'm really glad we did because it ended up being the muddiest hike that I've ever been on in my life. And it would have been horrible <laughs> without the mules. So no need to be stubborn when using mules. Okay, let's see. Did you manage to find any saxifrages or micranthes, my favorite genre? Um, no, we didn't see anything in the saxifragaceae family. There, I think, are some saxifragaceae species down there in Ecuador. I think they occur even at higher elevations than, than where we were at. So we only ever really, I think the highest we were at was like, 13,000 or a little over 13,000 feet. Um, but like I said, uh, the tallest peaks in Ecuador are all around 20,000 feet. So actually like the Paramos change significantly. And if you go high enough up, 
uh, they are like more like Arctic habitats, or some of them are even considered like semi-desert habitats because of how little rainfall they get, like cold desert habitats. Um, also one of my favorite families. There's so many cool ones here in Washington state. Let's see, do you have any recommendations on the type of easy to handle uh, camera used in these trips? Um, yes, I do. I use a camera called an Olympus TG5. Um, and that camera is waterproof, which is key for Ecuador. Everything is just soaked the entire time. My phone got flooded and I had to get it repaired because of the water damage. Um, but my camera, that camera is really cool because it's waterproof and it's like armored so you can drop it. It's really, really good at taking like macro photos and close up photos because it has a focus stacking mode where it can take multiple frames and combine them together digitally. Um, it's not very good at taking landscape pictures. For that, um, most of the landscape pictures in this are actually just from Mia's cell phone. Um, she was a little more careful to keep hers dry. And it's kind of amazing the pictures you can get with just a, a cell phone these days. Uh, we did invest in a nicer camera um, also that she used to get some of those bird photos and that, that bird video. Okay, let's see. Oh, tried to send money through PayPal and it said I needed an email. Nolan XE could not be found. Please advise. Okay, I really appreciate that comment. I'm just going to put my email up here real fast. It's pretty easy. It's just nolanxe at gmail.com. So thank you for anyone who's trying to send donations. I really, really appreciate it so much. Next question. Did you notice any recurrent particular tree species that was always uh, more full of epiphytes compared to other tree species? Hmm. That's a good question. I, a lot of the tree species look really similar at ground level. Um, I just tend to be more interested in plants that I can see and touch at ground level also. So I really didn't spend that much time looking up at the different tree species or trying to figure out what any of them are. Um, some tree species do have adaptations to prevent epiphytes from forming on them. A lot of trees will slough or shed bark because the epiphytes can get so thick that they um, can, can reduce the photosynthesis for that tree and choke the, the trunk. Or sometimes they get so heavy that they'll fall, um, they'll cause like the whole tree to blow over in a windstorm. So some trees will actually intentionally drop branches when they get too heavy with epiphytes to try and prevent them from receiving damage in a windstorm. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know about specific tree species, but different tree species do handle epiphytes differently. Let's see. Did you happen to record bryophytes from Ecuador? Considering you're from the Pacific Northwest, I'm always dreaming of the Pacific Northwest, which is a bryophyte paradise, to be honest. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The Pacific Northwest is a bryophyte paradise. Um, Ecuador is more of a bryophyte paradise, I think. We, the moss diversity there was unbelievable. And we just saw some of the like most bizarre like moss and lichen species that I've ever seen. Really interesting uh, morphologies and colors and patterns. And I'm sorry I didn't put more of this in the presentation. It was really difficult to decide what to put in the presentation. But um, if you don't follow me on Instagram already, uh, let's see, my Instagram is botanist at paradise and her botanist, botanist in paradise. There we go. Yeah, um, my Instagram has a lot more photos from our trip. Um, and I think I posted more mosses and such on there. Okay. What are some of the blooming cues for equatorial erase? 
That's a really interesting question. And I really have no idea because I'm not a specialist in any of these groups of, um, of plants. I've always considered myself something of a generalist species. I just kind of flit around from plant to plant, taking photos of um, whichever species catch my eye. And I don't know much about Aracy. I don't know what makes them bloom. Um, as I was saying earlier, lots of plants, they don't have the big seasonal cues, but I think a lot of plants will just accumulate resources until they feel like they're, like they have enough to produce flowers, um, like until they're mature enough to produce flowers. I think that's a common strategy. Or actually, I guess with aeroids or AC, a lot of them will, they'll climb until they have a certain amount of light that they're receiving. And then the, the shape of their leaves changes as they climb to be better adapted to the light that they're receiving. So I think a lot of them use like uh, the light levels as a cue for when to bloom. I hope that answers that question. Let's see. Before that, I wanna appreciate for the presentation and the amazing trip. Thank you so much. I really appreciate hearing that. Um, how long have you been on this trip? I saw lots of blooming orchids. I think it was a rare moment to see some blooming orchids. And what were your obstacles during this trip? Well, yes, normally for me, seeing orchids is a rare moment, um, but the sheer abundance of orchids in Ecuador was really incredible, but that didn't make it any less special, uh, especially because like almost every single one was different. And um, Orchids are always just incredible. And the, their pollination strategies, especially, just seem so varied and endless. I really, they really are one of my favorite groups of plants. Um, let's see, as for obstacles from the trip, uh, the first one that comes to mind is mud. We're always just stuck in the mud, like, like sometimes like actually stuck in the mud and, and worried that, um, we might not get out without losing a boot. Um, mud and rain were the biggest obstacles. It was really difficult to stay dry. Even with a rain jacket, it's just hopeless. You're just soaked all day. Um, as I mentioned, we got pretty lucky with, with insects. Um, there's not as many in the higher elevation areas anyways, because it's a little colder as far as, as biting insects go. Did get pretty bit up with mosquitoes in one spot. Um, yeah, that was it. Got a little bit of mild food poisoning here and there, but <laughs> really this trip went very smoothly, about as smoothly as you could possibly ask for. Ah, okay. I've got another comment. Need the last four digits of my phone number for Venmo. So I think you actually can confirm it without the last four digits. Um, but I'll just put them up here just in case. Uh, let's see, it's 7068. It, uh, both the PayPal and the um, Venmo should have different flower photos on them, if you are wondering if it's actually me. What is the rarest plant species that we saw? That's a great question. Um, I think, I think the Tegia orchids probably um, qualifies the rarest plant species we saw, or possibly the undescribed species that we saw, because we only saw it growing at this one place, and we, when we go back, we want to look around the area more and see if we can find other populations of it, but it's possible it could just be a, a single single site endemic. But a lot of these Tegia species, these are known to be single site endemics occurring on just one small like elevation band on one mountain or one ridge line. Yeah, those are really, really spectacular. All right, well, that's the last question. I really appreciate all these other comments too. It's so nice. I really I hope everyone enjoyed this. Um, this was really fun for me and I definitely will do something like this again after our next trip. Um, 
and I hope to see you all there. So once again, oh, let's see, one more last minute question. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions as long as you all want. So keep them coming if you have more. Um, did this experience inspire me for any particular future project? Um, yes, it did. Um, it inspired me to go back to some of the places that we went last time to try and document certain things um, better. And also um, some of the uh, people that we met on this trip um, inspired us to go plan some expeditions to some new places. So on our next trip, we're going to some really, really exciting places that have just barely been studied botanically or not even visited at all ever by botanists. So I am so, so excited for some of those upcoming um, floristic surveys the next time we go back. Okay, that looks like the last question. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and end it here. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day or evening.